Hey, hello, uh, this is Mario Ibarra Jr. I'm here with the amazing John Zender Estrada, uh, longtime uh, LA street legend, mural legend, graffiti legend, thinker, educator, on and on. We could go with the list of the accolades that are attached to this man sitting here with me today. Uh, hey, John, hey Zender, how you doing? All righty, here, what's up? Uh, I got a, a few questions for you um, mm -hmm. that we could get into today. Uh, first, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your history. Um, you could talk about it in relationship to your personal history, which is very influential on your art and your philosophical approach to life. Uh, I know you're like a Kung Fu master, mm -hmm. you're all these things. But can you just tell us a little bit about who John Zender Estrada is? Uh, okay, without being a little too over redundant, you might want to catch the movie later on when I'm older. <laughs> Everybody says my life should be a movie. But uh, I basically, uh, real quick, I, my life has been sort of like a layered, I, I call it almost like a Photoshop life. Everything's a layer. Um, every layer is unique to itself, but one layer also influences the next layer. Um, growing up, born in East Los Angeles is the first layer, getting influenced by the Mexican Chicano mural movements of the 1970s. That was a big influence on me, that Cholo lifestyle, homies, grew up in the heart of Little Valley. From there, transitioning, living with an alcoholic parent and losing my, my mother at a very young age and my sisters um, through the same uh, drug problems of my, uh, of my father. Uh, so we ended up moving from East Los Angeles in third grade to South Central LA in the 70s. And moving to South Central in the 70s uh, was not, it's actually more of where the movies are made from, you know, where there's predominantly gangs. Uh, South Central in the 70s was really, really tough. That was a tough neighborhood. Um, taking the, the, the mentality of, of what I learned in East LA of being a homeboy and now solidifying it for, for reals, you know, getting my first gun in sixth grade, um, hanging out with the homies really hardcore uh, by the time I was in seventh grade and, and doing the whole homeboy thing in South Central. Um, that would be like, like the termination of the first layer, which I call it the homeboy era. Uh, from that, my father ends up getting shot and killed in South Central. Uh, and I have to find a, a, a location to, to move. Actually, where I was at was with my best friend's house where they were kind of like my adopted parents. And I thought I was going to be cool and just stay with them, but an aunt came and picks me up and says, you know, I, I, I need your money. I need your, the, the residual that's supposed to come with you for taking care of you. So she did it for the money. But anyways, uh, I ended up moving to Maywood. There in Maywood it would be considered the second uh, layer of, of my life, which is called the hip-hop layer. Uh, in Maywood, I started fizzing out the gang kind of attitude because it just seemed like there was no point. There was too many like wannabe gang members in Maywood and Bow. It was like, it wasn't real. I grew up in the heart of gangs and these guys looked like they were imitations because they didn't, they didn't understand what the real deal was. So I kind of just kind of said, well, this is not real. I don't want to be here educating people on how to dress and how to walk, how to talk, to be a gang member. So hip-hop comes in comes in hard, run DMC, all this other stuff, breaking, you know, in the 80s, this is 80s. So I, that totally um, uh, just completely uh, takes my attention because of the colors and the movement and how it just crosses cultures, crosses, crosses ethnicity. And I became a break dancer, became a rapper, what they call an all-around b-boy back in the days. Now it's all split up, but an all-around b-boy. What was your rapper name again? I was, uh, I was Shaky D in the place to be, taking it to the T.O.P., you know what I'm saying? So it was kind of cool growing up in that era because I got to rap with some people that- But did you say M uh, MC Fro uh, Frost? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. That's the funny thing about Frost is that when I ran into Frost recently, he he, he says, uh, yeah, I, I thought I just gonna meet him for the first time. So I'm like, I was like, what's up, Frost? He's like, what's up, Shaky D? And I'm going, what? <laughs> I said, what the? He says, so he says, he says, I, I remember you. You were out there rapping in a radio tron. I was that little kid checking you out. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so that was actually really cool that anyone was paying attention. <laughs> and, and we're talking about MC Frost. But, um, this is for the Rasa. Yeah, thing. this is for the Rasa for, uh, Kid Frost. Yeah, yeah so that was cool. Frost. So then, yeah, once Kid I saw Frost a video of him when he was in, in the 80s, I, I, I remembered him. I'm like, oh, okay, the guy, that's the guy that would kick it with OG Jekko and all, all of us. You know, so. I, I made the connection finally, <laughs> so so the hip hop era took me took me pretty cool. But as as time goes on, uh, from high school, you you know you you have to do what you got to do as far as hip hop. You do your dance, you do your competitions, and I I didn't think like anything. You don't think it's gonna go anywhere. You think it's just a little cool little kid, 
you know, marbles or something, you know. So I didn't pursue the new it. Game, the new game. Yeah, the new game. So I didn't pursue it to the heart. I didn't want to be no no professional dad. I didn't want to be crazy legs or anything like that, you know. I just wanted to, you know, battle just for the fun of it. But what did take my attention because I was already an artist was the graffiti aspect. Yeah. And the graffiti aspect t- kind of took its role through through the music video of uh of uh, Buffalo Gals, oh, yeah. you know, where Dondi, Rock, I didn't, Rock Steady Park. yeah, the, uh, Rock, uh, Dondi's just rocking this huge production as, as Malcolm McLaren's just, you know, going with his, you know, two Buffalo Gals, and, and he's rocking this big piece, <gasps> yeah, and I'm looking at that going, wow, look at this guy rock that cam, you know, prior to that, I used to do blocks, lowrider, you know, 3D letters with old English script, with Chicano font, I, I, you know, I did the whole Cholo writing, so I didn't, Color was not even introduced. Yeah, all the, all the 45s in your house are messed up. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> all the album covers. Go exactly. Read. I have a cholo writing on everything, you know, how that goes. So then uh, uh, I, in high school, I decided to, to take kind of graph, you know, a little bit at a time to add to my hip hopness, yeah. you know, and, and as, and, and while I was doing Architecture my graffiti, of your exactly. So at the, at, in Maywood during that time, there was very little graffiti art and hardly no graffiti art. So the, the riverbeds were completely blank. Oh. They, there was very little graffiti. There was mostly like some gang graffiti, some stoner graffiti, you know, stoner, some love, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so yeah, yeah. very typical graffiti, but no graph. Yeah. So I lived right near in Slauson and the riverbed. So man, I saw that and I said, wow my own studio for like 15 miles mm-hmm. <laughs> so i i decided to use the riverbed as my background for just practice yard mm-hmm. um we created a crew called bomb city boys we had all, all the i was teaching all the kids about it i picked up really fast uh, at the time i was graph and then i mo- moved on to phase 52 and phase 52 was like my my street name and when i went to the radiotron for the first time that's the name that i took to the radiotron was phase 52 um, and that was my tagger, bomber, bus bomber. I let people tell me, you know, hey, did Zender, did, Zender, did you ever do any illegal graffiti? And, and with Zender, I didn't. Mm-hmm. So people say, so I, I can actually say, no, I didn't do no really legals with Zender. I'm being technical. Uh-huh. But if you say, what about Phase 52? Oh, heck yeah, I'll burn it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, and that's the part that I, I keep it on the low, low now, and, you know, because I don't want to promote vandalism. You know, I'd rather promote the art world. Yeah. So, but Phase 52 was the the vandal part of me you know and that one came to a drastic end one day when i'm in bow high school waiting for the bus to go to verdugo because i ended up going to verdugo for getting into a fight in bow and i'm in the in the in the morning you know seven o'clock in the morning waiting for the bus and i said to myself how can i get as famous as possible with these kids here in the school and the only way i can think of is to go hard and go home so i wanted to throw a huge face 52 right inside the principal's office in his wall i said oh, this is gonna make me famous so i grab out my big fat uni big fat unis are like like a four inch marker you know wide you know pop start hitting a p h a z e five two and as i curve the two my arm just swings around because somebody grabbed it and it's the principal with this look on his face that if he had laser beams in his eye, I would have been disintegrated. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) That guy was like, he was so mad there was no words coming out of his mouth. And he looked at me and he said, you got two choices. Either you clean the entire school, including my wall, you know, paint over my wall, or we call the police department. At the time, it wasn't really, graffiti wasn't as rough as it is today. I would have got a felony, life in prison probably today. <laughs> with, today with today's standards, I would have been, yeah, I would have been, a, a, you know, a death row or something, you know. But, uh, but at the time, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as, as crazy. Vandalism was still vandalism, you know, misdemeanor. So, so I cleaned up the school, but it, it, really put, it really put a zap on me. To get busted that cold was almost like a warning for me. Like, what, what am I really trying to get, you know? So, so I, I, I pretty much dumped Phase 52 and said, okay, he had his run. Let's, let's give him. And I decided to create... Yeah, he uh, was a subject of after school. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I decided to create a name that I would be a little bit more creative with, and I chose Zender, which to me represents the Rising Mountain, and um, and actually decided not to really talk to too many people about my name. It wasn't like I didn't want to be like famous in that. I wanted to be more artistic. So even when I would do a Zender production somewhere, you know, I wouldn't tell nobody that was me, and I would hear people. Um, talk about me at, at these yards, you know, oh, yo, who's that dude, Zender, man? I'd be like right next to him going, I don't know, dude, but he's pretty dope. <laughs> and they're like, and it wasn't until later on where everybody started exposing who they were mm-hmm. in the 80s, you know, with K2S. Like, you know, everybody, we all started meeting together that we began to sort of like connect with other writers. But still, the mainstream world was 
we we would consider it you know um, kind of like we wanted to keep anonymous that and what they call anonymity whatever anonymity, anonymity, anonymity yeah anonymity. yeah anonymous. exactly <laughs> we wanted to keep it uh, where the outside world does not know what's going on inside the graph yeah. world. Only those inside knew who Xander was. Only those inside knew who Crime or Prime or any of these guys were. Uh -huh. and, and, and that's the way we wanted it. You know, yeah. that was the intent. Yeah, it was so like that a way, secret society. Yeah, it was like a very secret. And that, that was the intent so that when you did a, a painting or, or a piece in the wall, no, it, you know, no one would really know right away where to go get you yeah, or, it was or like find the, you. It was like that long lost graffiti movie where that kid saw the cop kill the other kid and he did the Zor. I don't know. Yeah, I think that was a uh, Taki one. No, that was a uh, Turk, Turk 182 kind of thing. Was that no, one? no, it was like another one with that kid that came from uh, Escape from Witch Mountain and he was like a graffiti, he was like a graffiti artist and he saw a cop kill a kid and then he did like this piece of like the cop killing the kid. Oh, wow, yeah. And, uh, it was one of these, one of the ones that came on like one time. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> but uh, it was like, uh, but that, that 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 notion of anonymity, like the Zorro ness. Yeah, of it, exactly. Like, you know, but like just getting out, getting getting in, doing what you had to do, getting out, and leaving that Z with the exactly. with and the that, saber. And that was the actual most in, for me at least that was the most interesting part of graffiti the covertness yes yeah, the 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 operation the mission the the uh, we're going to do this beautiful piece and people are going to wake up in the morning and go what where did it come from who did it what and no one knowing who and everybody making up rumors everybody making up stories mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that was the whole point so 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 that would be you know the second layer of my life which is the graffiti you know world mm -hmm. and that was you know that opened up also doors to to uh art school because you know at at, at um, high school you know you, the more involved you are with art the more involved you are with getting getting your academics straight and that's a whole nother story of like going to an all-white school where I was in Bal and in Bal my B's were pretty cool when you get to an all-white school my B's turn into D's mm. because the academic standards are a lot higher yeah, for, the, the for curve is higher. yeah the curve is higher for white people over there because they, they you know we hear that all Mexicans oh, give them some break you know give them <laughs> they can graduate without knowing their timetables it's all good man <laughs> yeah. but so I learned to just jump on the game real quick and take take my academics a lot serious especially um, if I wanted to get a free I wanted to get a free ride to college you know yeah. I can't afford college so yeah. so I ended up getting you know scholarships for Otis and and that was so close to the Radiotron, where it was in the Wilshire, you know. Uh, where exactly Park. was Radiotron? Radiotron was actually right there on on Sixth Street and and a small little street. I remember the I don't remember. I think it was Parkview, but I'm not really sure. The so name it was, was right there. In Wilshire. Yeah, it was right there, right next to McManus and, and Morgan. Now, now everybody called Koreatown. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, Koreatown. We cut the park. Right, right, city. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So so and Otis was right in front of MacArthur Park. So it's literally like walking distance. So I had already knew about Radiotron before I went to Otis. So when the time I got to Otis. Uh, I would just walk to Radiotron on the weekends and kind of hang out and hang out with Carmelo and hang out with all these writer kids and mm -hmm. and uh, and do a bunch of little projects. Yeah, can you can you explain a little bit because I don't know if everybody doesn't know what Radiotron exactly was. I know Carmelo Alvarez had started Radiotron. He also went on to form the Peace, what is it, Peace and Justice. Yeah, Center? the Peace and Justice Center. And, yeah. uh, Radiotron was like the first version of that, and 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 what came? What was it? What what, what was a typical visit to Radiotron? Radiotron, is, and if you, anybody does a little research, was was originally a, a club from from New York. The New York uh, New York Cats came from New York, came to LA to establish some little uh, nighttime club, and it was called the Radio, not Tron, but just the Radio. Mm -hmm. uh, they decided to uh, use that same scenario of the Radio Club to do. Um, like a documentary, I don't know if you, you you've seen the documentary. There's a documentary about Ice T and his and his and his educating the kids uh, with the radio. And uh, um, I don't remember the name of it right now, but but there's a there's a, there's an old it's an old documentary. I, I I just barely seen it. I didn't even know about it. It was underground for years and years, and oh. and it's barely up, coming up now. Well, anyway, so what they did is they also. Um, so they had they so they this club thing on the uh, they used it for this thing and all of a sudden I guess the New Yorker cat sort of phased out and they didn't want to do it anymore so so they they left the 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 abandoned kind of the, the whole scenario Carmelo comes in and sort of says well I want to rent this the building I want to kind of continue this concept that you guys left of the radio club but I want to you know just so to to re-identify it from the radio he's going to now rename it the Radio Tron mm -hmm. so now it became the Radio Tron which is try to he tried to maintain the same um, vibe that the club the radio did you know by bringing more la based artists you know mm -hmm. uh i don't know if you guys know but uh ice t was from new york mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think he's og from la but no he's from new york he was you know came from new york uh and a lot of the writers even the graffiti writers that were painting 
at the Redatron at the time were from New York, which is a soon and legit. Mm -hmm. uh, and they they began to establish sort of like the, the standard of graffiti, soon and legit. And and the rappers uh, that were coming through the Redatron were also setting the standards. People like the, the Air Force crew were setting this. So people that were really high skilled were already setting the standard in the club of the Radiotron. So mm -hmm. when you were a kid and you came into the Radiotron trying to perfect your skills, you got to sort of challenge yourself to see this is where the peak is, this is where the, 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 the professional, yeah, the bar is. So if you wanted to be good, you had to be better. And the only way to get better was to compete. So a lot of kids would compete at the Radiotron for breaking, for popping, for rapping. There were battles. Um, there was graffiti battles outside of the walls and the alleys. So, so that was the, the interesting thing. I think that was probably the most... Um, influential part of the Radiotron is that it became the the uh, the mecca for hip hop. It was also sense. like the competitive arena. The competitive right? arena. It became the gladiator school of hip hop. Or boxing yeah, team. the boxing ring too. <laughs> that you know, I know for us as writers, we had to recreate uh, our style in, in, in street art because soon and legit, a bunch of other New York cats that would show up really had already a way a, a, a heads up on us. They had a an advantage because they already had years of, of doing that. We were just trying to start it. But I think we held our, our ground pretty good by introducing the whole Chicano flavor and Gothic letters and, you know, mm -hmm. the and imagery and more artistic element rather than just words. Mm -hmm. And I think that set us apart in the end. Mm -hmm. But that, that was the Radiotron. And I think uh, Little Caesar eventually took over uh, the rights to the Radiotron and he does a breakdance competition now every year. From what I heard, like, uh, what are we, like 2013, I think this is the 30, this is the 30 year anniversary of the radio. And they're going to do an event at MacArthur Park soon, I think oh, in a couple months. Sure. So it's going to be pretty big. But through, through all these different layers that you're calling them, these Photoshop layers, the, the early kind of East LA, South Central, moving further, like East, Southeast, uh, crossing the LA River again, you were just going back and forth over the river, it seems, uh, and those, these kind of phases, seeing the, seeing the river bed as being your canvas. Uh, all these things were also kind of a kind of development or, or stratas and layers of like, a street aesthetic or approaches, right? Like the idea of cholo and the kind of aesthetics that were involved in the dress and the writing, etc. Then into hip hop with the aestheticization of kind of New York influence uh, and these things kind of building up uh, and making the layer that is now like what we're looking at, a kind of image of these kind of layers uh, or flat, let's flatten the image for yeah. <laughs> and see like where, what, what, what were, or how influential were these kind of street aesthetic sensibilities and then how did you filter them through an art school experience because that's pretty heavy these aesthetic positions that you're taking and, and following and then going through art school with them how, how did that filter through yeah through art school that's a really good question because uh, every every art form whether it's cholo i mean every everything that happens to young people some people don't understand it because they're not artists so they don't interpret things from an aesthetic perspective a lot of people just interpret things from a from a cycle cycle you know mental um uh, you know personality emotional a lot of people who are not artists they can't translate the information that the experiences they're going through uh, any other way except psychological, emotional distress, you know, whether it's, you know, baggage or I ended up like, feelings. With, yeah, the, everything's feeling for me. It wasn't as much feelings because it was more uh, I'm an artist. So I would have to take the, the influences of each layer and then sort of figure out why is it is why is that visual so important like for example if you were a cholo why was the dress so important i was really concerned with the dress yeah. to the point where when i was a cholo in south central i didn't have the mindset of a cholo i didn't want to walk around thinking i was dope i didn't want to walk around with a gun and say where you from miss it just for the fun of it i used to call it a costume mm -hmm. it was like being on stage it was like zoot suit for me mm -hmm. when i put on the shoes and the pendleton and the hat and the and the and the style Orale, patos, que tal, calmantes, montes, chicas, patas, ese. You know, I was on was stage. Style. I was on stage. Yeah. It was like a, a rope. It girls was would, it was yeah, exactly. So that was the art form of it. And girls would just kind of draw to that. You know, I would walk with a cane. What's up with your leg? Nothing. It just looks bad, eh? <laughs> 
and it's then like the dapper Don exactly and then and the hip hop had its own genre man with the with the crazy pants and the berets and the and the spike this is pre yeah, yeah. you know le, you know hip b boy this is b boy yeah, from yeah. early 80s this is Grand not Master Flash. yeah this is a grandmaster <laughs> flash africa bambara influence yeah, yeah. you know it was wild Bond, bondage gear. exactly the more <laughs> wild you looked when you danced your pop the the more dramatics you put in so i had you know the bonsai bandana and i had the bonsai bandanas on my i mean all the colors of the rainbow on one leg of bandanas people I, i'm glad nobody took pictures <laughs> Have been blackmailing me all this time. Yeah, yeah like the Fred rerun. Barry exactly, Barry. and so so all that visuals were very very interesting to me. And when graffiti, obviously graffiti, graffiti with the colors that they have can actually take that to the next level of taking all the genres and creating something tangible as a work of art. And then going into art school with that mindset, art school was a very formal institution or art, art school was very like this is how we want you to draw we don't want you to you know and it was very difficult because i still wanted to do graffiti and i remember the first time i went you know actually i think it was like in my third year at otis um I, they allowed me to have a, a one-man show at their dining hall it was they had a gallery but they used to use the dining hall as a secondary gallery space for like you know, uh, create, yeah, to do student show. So I, they gave me, and I said, wow, this is amazing. So I went, you know, I, I went, I went fun house. You know, I went, <laughs> I went straight out of, you know, the, the Futura 2000, New York. I went and filled that place up with graffiti on canvas, seeing Blondie, it, Blondie Rapture, Blondie video. Rapture video going on, <laughs> DJ going on, breakers at my opening. <laughs> And it was an it was an homage to to Basquiat at the time because he, him and and Keith Haring and and Kenny Sharp all the New York school cats were calling everything neo expressionism, mm. which is they didn't want to call it graffiti so I, I, I they were calling it neo expressionism so my show was called neo expressionism mm -hmm. it, to try to piggyback off what the New Yorkers were doing in New York obviously everyone did not have a clue what I was trying to do it was completely oblivious to L A people um, <laughs> no one from the art world showed up no one from Otis showed up. <laughs> Not even your student. Not friend. even my student friends showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I rented Otis. <laughs> so it was like it was almost like if they gave me the keys and said, "Do whatever you want. We're out of here. Let's we're, go." We're, we're, going, we're going to go off to Vegas for we're the weekend. We're going to Vegas for the we'll exactly. Come back on Monday. Please, please make sure that everything's cleaned up. <laughs> exactly. So I mean, because they allowed me, because no one was there from the staff, we went buck. We painted on the walls. Oh, we did graffiti because as long as they said you can paint on the wall, as long as you paint it back. Yeah. So we rocked the production on the wall. I did this one eye monster, you know that that eyeball from from uh, that that famous the Von Dutch one. Yeah, Von Dutch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I did the Von Dutch with the with the with the claws. It was dope, man. For 1988, <laughs> it was sick, you know. And all the break. It was a b boy. It was like a radiotron party, dude. Yeah, but it was yeah. it was supposed to be an art thing. And I thought, you know, yeah, you know, that the was art, how art was. That's what art, art for you wasn't separate from culture. exactly. And I also had seen so much of the of the influence of New York that I really wanted to experience it. Okay, Zender, we're talking about a time that is pre-internet. We're talking about a time pre yes. that is pre-magazine. Yep. Uh, with all, how were you seeing this information? How were you looking at what was happening? How did you know that these artists from such and such were calling things neo expressionism? Expressionism. How were you finding this information? Most of the time, it was through a hungered research. Hungered research means it's kind of like when you buy a new car, you don't notice the car until you buy it. Once you know it, you become conscious of it. Once you become conscious of it, you want to find out as much as you can of it. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like that. Once I found out that hip hop and, and graffiti had its origins in New York, I would research every anything in, in a music video. If somebody said, hey man, there's a music video with a gap band, I think that has a breakers in it. I would re try to find it, go to MTV and watch all day hoping it was gonna air. <laughs> and once it airs, you take your, your little camcorder, your big huge, they used to be like movie cameras from the yeah. television and you know, and record it. And then play it back oh. because there wasn't recording device, so you, so everything was you had to do the effort to record. Yeah. Uh, Polaroid pictures, any any. I mean, I would I would literally go to libraries and go 
skimmed through all the art form magazines. All the art form was the one that was my main source for graffiti because it would have really good articles, yeah. and I would read them. And that's where you were you seeing that at school at Otis because art form is not on the newsstand next to Teen Angel and down right, down. right. <laughs> well, I would actually go to the bookstores back book then. Store, yeah, right. I would literally go to bookstores looking for anything that had any article because I knew it wasn't going to be no books. There was no books. Magazines were the closest thing, okay. so I would actually go to the library. So libraries did have. Magazine. Uh, magazine, so I would rip pages. Oh, you're that guy. Yeah, <laughs> if you went to an art magazine in the 80s and to a public library, skimmed through a bunch of missing pages, it was me taking the article on <laughs> Tandi, <laughs> on Futura or something like that, and oh, making okay. it into collection. That was me. So, so you were kind of building a kind of a, a, a bridged, footnoted education for yourself that was happening in tandem with what you were learning in school. Right. We were getting the officialness of how to draw classically, how to paint academically, etc. And you were making like this kind of side education for yourself that was going out and finding this hunger research and finding this information that was kind of supplementing what you were getting in school. Exactly. And I think everything came into place when I met Al Nodell. Al Nodell was a, at the time was a curator. Uh, for the gallery at Otis, and then I took like a little small little um, on-campus job, uh, work study, you know they call it, and yeah. I ended up working at the gallery at Otis and meeting Al Nodell, and I became his assistant, and I, he showed me a lot about how the gallery runs and how to set it up, set up shows, and but his influence, That's he was funny because that, when I was a student at Otis, that was my job too. <laughs> <laughs> so at the time they. Uh, uh, Al Nodell um, was on his way to politics. He, I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. I just thought he was just a guy that was really, you know, a go-getter. But he was already in, in his way to, to, to create a future in politics for himself. And I didn't know that. So what he was trying to do is he was pushing the concept of art in the park. Mm -hmm. And he was the guy who put the, the concept of art in the park together. He put uh, the grants together to put more artwork in MacArthur Park. He would subcontract artists to put the sculptures, the poetry garden. The, you know, he did a lot in MacArthur Park that took it to the level where it's at now. As far, well, not now anymore because of the, the, the transitions it's gone to. But in these early 80s, MacArthur Park was now considered an art park. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he even coined the term Art in the Park, which has became a, a, a city program. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he hired uh, a group of artists, of mainstream artists, actually Otis alumni, uh, Gronk. Uh, uh, Gronk was in there. I, mean, it was, it, I think he invited Gronk, but I don't think he, could, he did it. I know it was Patsy Valdez uh, was the one that uh, took lead on a project at the park. And through, through Patsy uh, and the Radiotron, he connected with like a handful of artists of graffiti artists to do the the very first I mean I'm gonna say it's probably like our very first commissioned piece for us as street artists mm -hmm. which was the the band shell oh yeah uh, and shell. yeah band, and and that's when for me it kind of hit because prior to that band shell gig graffiti art remained in the street graffiti mm -hmm. art remained illegal mm -hmm. and when I was in Otis trying to bring graffiti into my art projects um, it didn't seem to uh, you know, be, apply. I did one piece in my drawing class at Otis where I did a, a dream where I did some graffiti, uh, a guy getting shot with a shotgun and a low rider. It was all black and white. The only thing that was in graffiti in color was, and it ended up winning the Otis Award and it got sent to New York to, to represent Otis. And that was a big deal for the teachers, but I didn't, I mean, they should have shipped me to New York. I would have been happier, you know, <laughs> but I didn't see, I didn't, and I guess that's probably why I didn't feel the impact of that. You know, my work going to New York and everybody winning some awards, I didn't, I didn't go. So I didn't feel it. I didn't see it. So it came back. You know, oh, congratulations. I didn't see nothing. So it didn't exist to me. So when I saw that band shell happen and we rocked it with the, the We Are the World piece all the way around, um, for the, and in the, it came out on the cover. I mean, actually, my photo came out in the, in the op La Opinion cover oh. with Al Nodell. And that's where, for the first time, me, the, the homie from East LA, the guy trying to stay alive in South Central, the B-boy, the, the breaker, whatever, for the first time was in a newspaper on the cover. You, you know, highlighted it. I got highlighted. And for you that. were not just the piece, but exactly. You, too. That's, you it, and Al, or just you? It was me and Al. Okay. Just me and Al, uh, side by side. I still have the, uh, the clipping of that. Uh -huh. We're sitting there, and it said, you know, Al Nodell and artist John. It, back then, it was Danny, Danny Estrada, uh, artist from Otis, you know, doing art in the park. And I was like, wow, that meant like I have never been, I mean, never been in the paper. So I was like, wow. I looked, I stared at that picture for hours going, 
damn, this is this is real. You know, this yeah. is not real. Like they do in the Basquiat. Boom, for real. <laughs> you know? And and that meant, means that now I'm sort of seeing where that connection, that bridge is between graffiti and the real world. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the connection before until, you know. Okay, so there's, so, let, so let's make another connection. So there's mm -hmm. like the graffiti world, the real world, art world, mm -hmm. that, where all those things peaking at that same EQ level at that moment for you? Uh, I, I don't think, not all of them. The, 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 uh, the art world was still, for me, very underground. I wasn't like, thinking about exhibiting. I wasn't thinking about showing. I was just thinking about homework and getting these things done. <laughs> student work. Yeah, my student work was... Yeah. was and I noticed they keep you busy. I noticed they do keep you very, very busy with, with, with all these... I mean, every, I mean, especially when you're doing you know, first and second year of old is you have so many diversity of classes. It's not like you're doing it probably, but like your third and fourth. Now you're just focused on your own career. But yeah, prior to that, you're doing everything. My second year, one of my teachers said, what do you think this is? This is art boot camp. You exactly. don't have to do what you want to do. Yet. Exactly. And I was like, I thought that's what I signed up. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Yeah, that's he, called studio time. He's like, no, this is art boot camp. I was like, damn, I didn't know. I didn't want to go no army, no boot camp. Yeah. Uh, so, so, let, so let's bridge that because then you know, you you finish school. A lot of things happen in your life between there and two. There's a we could have a whole other interview. Oh yeah, there's a whole that. there's a lot of details about a lot but, of other things. But then I, I I met you about 1991 or two or three somewhere yeah. in there, and uh, that's uh, when you were uh, you had an exhibition, a solo exhibition at Homeland, mm -hmm. which were paintings from your experience, and uh, uh, you could talk about that if you want to. But uh, but at the same time you were building a kind of reputation as being one of the most prolific mural painters in the city of Los Angeles. Like, I don't know what the exact numbers were, if it was around 300 or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, but I remember everywhere, every bus route, or every, every route around the city, you had uh, murals ranging from small ones to huge ones. And a lot of them weren't necessarily graffiti based, but they were more like kind of Chicano imagery, uh, you know, education, Raza, history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in tandem with that, you were developing a lot of pedagogical or workshop philosophical approaches to teaching. And you were starting to work with a lot of young people at that time. So can you, can you kind of bridge us in from like, okay, if the aesthetics of your past were kind of somehow morphed into some experience in art school and you were bridging that with a kind of art education. And then where does that where does that lead you to start developing your own philosophical approaches about uh, passing on information uh, to young people as a teacher? Because um, that's also been really important to your your development. So as as, as you heard, most of the the stuff that I've said so far has been very experiential. Experiential, you know, it's been it's experiences. A lot of it hasn't been conceptualized yet because it's moving so fast. I don't really have time to think. Well, in 1988, I did have enough time to think, and that's because I ended up um, in my senior year actually um, going from Otis straight to prison uh, based on a personal uh, based on a personal uh, um, experience with, with my own personal life about uh, a crime which we went away for the movie for the details on that one but it, it's gonna be it's gonna be a good movie, Is that a movie? <laughs> it like, it's a trilogy it's a trilogy, no? it's a tri oh yeah yeah you're gonna see the, the it's gonna start backwards with the end and then we go back with like Star Wars <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so in in prison, um, I did from 1988, which is my senior year, to like uh, 91, uh, 88, 90, 90. So about three or four years in prison, and um, that's where it became very conceptual. Because in prison, you have a lot of time to think, you have a lot of time to write. So I would just write and write and write pages, even if I wasn't designing or thinking about printing anything. It wasn't like I'm writing a book. It was just me writing all this, everything I said in the past, trying to figure out how it all makes sense. So that's where I drew the conclusion that that life is precious. Life is, you know, uh, you can't just throw it away. You can't kick it. You can't just, you know, you got to do something with it. Um, and I did a, a lot more research on just art in general while in prison. Any book, any art book, I would read it cover to cover. Any art magazine, I would read it from cover to cover. And by the time I got out in 91, um, being an ex-con, you can't just work anywhere. Uh, I was fortunate to get a job at the Conservation Corps. And this is in 91. So during 1991, they gave me a job as a, as a youth mentor, youth counselor. Um, and that kind of established the, 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 the concept of being of youth, anything to do with youth. I'm not, at the time, I'm not going to say I was a youth mentor or youth counselor. I just wanted to 
I was more like a, 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 an experience sharer at the time. I didn't think I don't think I had the experience to really be a good mentor because you know what are you gonna what are you what are you gonna tell me? Hey, oh, check it out, hey. You know this is how the this is how the the, the prison works. And, and I remember when I was when I just got out of prison, I spoke like that. It wasn't until Channel Seven did the the Person of the Week, you know, TV thingy where I heard myself talk and I thought, oh my god, that can't be me. It was like, hey, why why do you like kids or what do you why are you working on these on these projects? And I'd be like, hey, check it out, eh? it's because the kids, you know, they need a lot of work, eh? and they need to. And I, and I wasn't conscious that's the way I was talking until I saw myself on television. And so I said, dang, I got to make an effort to even change that because I know that that's not who I am. That's what I become subconsciously in prison because I didn't even notice. It was like going to England and coming back with an English accent. You know, you don't recognize you have until it's too late. Well, that's, 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 that's like when I went to Texas, I came back calling everybody y'all. Yeah, y'all. Oh, y'all, yeah, yeah, y'all. Back, hey, y'all, let's go eat. I'm like, y'all. Like, <laughs> exactly. You pick up these habits, you know. So yeah, I picked yeah. up the prison lingo, picked up the, the prison yeah, wall. Because you adapt to your environment. Exactly. It keeps you alive. And so I needed to change. So I made an effort to begin to start changing my journey excuse me, as to who I am. And I think um, and it wasn't until 1992, if you guys remember the LA riots mm -hmm. uh, or the politically correct, you know, LA insurgency. uprising. Yeah, the urgency. So, you know, <laughs> uprising. I don't even know what they The LA, the LA insurgency? Yeah, the, 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 the uh, uprising, uprising. disturbances of Los Angeles. I don't know, <laughs> whatever. It was a straight out riot, man. It was like, wee -haw. <laughs> they went buck wild. Yeah, they, it was looters. Who it was looters. Who, yeah, man. It was. I'm. I'm. I'm actually tripping because I. I wasn't in the street during. The, I know I was supposed to be because we were supposed to do a big, you know, uh, big cleanup, but it didn't happen. So I ended up staying home and I watched it on television. Mm -hmm. The other rights. I watched the whole thing on television. The whole burning. Everything on TV. Helicopters. And I. And I just felt so weird because it, it looked like a movie. Like I. Because I was living in. Uh, I was living in Southgate at the time, so it was kind of a little. I was, you know, it didn't affect Southgate. Yeah. But the next day, I was sent out with the Conservation Corps to go back and start doing the cleanups and start, you know, I was out there with Edward James almost sweeping the streets kind of thing. Uh -huh. And um, so... Did you, talk, did you talk to him like that? Like, hey, Holmes, No, I didn't, even, I didn't even... Actually, at the time, I didn't even know who he was. <laughs> they would have introduced me to him. I didn't know who he, I wouldn't even, who he was. I just got out of prison, bro. It wasn't until I saw American Me that I figured out it was him. Oh, <laughs> And uh, and and so during the during that time there were all these boarded up buildings. I mean, boarded yeah, up. Everything, everything right. was boarded. I mean, if you were around in 1992, I mean, it looked like like you know like the South Bronx. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, all we needed was a brick building, but everything was boarded up. And what I did with with the kids is I'm very one thing that prison did teach me was that you can go with the flow and then just be like the media and focus on the negativity. Or you can actually take a stand and do something about it. And so we created a, a little group, little art group with our kids called Creative Solutions. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were write, Creative Solutions. And our objective was to teach the kids how to create imagery that countered or, or, or allowed a, a, a creative solution to what was going on in the city. Mm -hmm. So the kids, I mean, when you talk to kids and, you, and they're growing up in the media of Los Angeles or the media of LA, and you tell them, you know, Let's let's create a campaign for anti-drug campaign. They will just do the obvious, you know, a gun with a circle and you know pills with a circle and a egg, you know, a guy getting loaded and 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 a death. They always will draw to the negativity aspect. No matter what problem you give them, they will will they'll try to pull out the problem. And that's the obvious because that's the media. But that's not the solution. That's not the solution. That's the problem. That's the problem. So most kids, young kids think that that's how you solve is addressing the problem head on and, you know, throw, pull out the realities of the problem. No, no, that is already evident. It's the solution that we are looking for. And that's the one that's the hardest to come up with. Mm -hmm. It's like a scientist coming out with a cure of cancer. You know, yeah. we already know what cancer does. Yeah. We already know the effects. Yeah, that's we already, the known. yeah. You're looking for the unknown. where's the cure and 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 to find the X cure. Factor. Yeah, is the hardest thing, especially for a kid or for a young person to develop. So that was my objective with these kids. Mm -hmm. I want if they if they came to me with an idea, with a picture or a concept, it had to be a solution. It was if it was another problem, I would just literally tell them, go away. 
go away. <laughs> and then, so the kids were challenged to be in my group and they were completely challenged. So when we started putting the billboard imagery, we did images of, images of hope, images of, of a Korean and an African American shaking hands. We would do a, a, a field of crop where a Koreans on one side and an Africans American growing vegetables together, you know, we were like, that's just like possibilities. possibilities of, of yeah. a community <laughs> garden and, yeah. and in, in Koreatown slash MacArthur Park, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this is 92 before those things even existed. Yeah, yeah. So, so media picked up on it. And once the media picked up on it, they were like, you know, magazine article after article after article during that time of how we were doing this. Mm -hmm. um, they were interviewing the kids. We had TV. That's where the Channel 7 thing kicks in with the person of the week. Um, so definitely that idea of producing as much artwork and as a, in, a, in a short amount of a time as possible is the seed to my mural concept, to my mural programming. Okay. Because I was now in the in ninth, all from 1992, 93, and 94, those three years I was, I maintained that group called Creative Solutions, just doing nothing but community projects, murals. Anytime we had a vandalism problem, where, because I used to do graffiti removal for the city of, of, with the MacArthur um, Conservation Corps, I was noticing that they were measuring the square footage and submitting documents and I know Conservation Corps is going to hate me for saying this because I'm exposing stuff here now. I'm the whistleblower here, okay? So check this out. They were getting money for square footage of how much graffiti removed. Buff zones. Buff, yeah, they were so saying... they buff marks. They're getting square footage for buff marks. They were money, saying... Money, Exactly. They said the grants were like this. They said, submit the square footage of how much graffiti removal you do a week, a month, a year. And the numbers were exaggerated. I mean, they were extreme. Why? Because... If you take a community like South Central and you send out a crew, you're literally removing the graffiti every single day at the exact same locations. Yeah. That's not the turf. That yeah, that is not really graffiti removal in the numbers. That's just the same. It's like how many how many you know how many. Uh, Tons of poop does the American public flush out? You know, well, it could go in the thousands because it's the same. You got to do what you got to do. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so at the same time, uh, um, how would I say? Um, the, the numbers were, were not adding up in my, in my game. Yeah, yeah. So I said, we got to create a solution again. This is not a, So I decided to take my crew and say, what is the root of the palm of graffiti? Gang, taggers, mobbers, you know, beef wars, whatever. So I took a small area in the Hooper district and said, I'm going to monitor the CIA graffiti. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to do an intel thingy and document this saying, this is how much vandalism and how much graffiti is occurring during this month. What we're going to do is we're going to target the area by hiring the guys who do it. So I went deep undercover. Yo, what up, man? I'm Zender One. You want to know who's, who's you know, who's here? Because I didn't know who the names were. It was mostly the guys from NTS, you know? So we hired them. We joined in the crew. We had some guys from, from the Primera, some guys from 38, some guys from, you know, 20, whatever neighborhoods were out there. And I would seek them out, the young kids, and hire them in my crew. And then they would be the ones that would paint the murals. Mm. Lo and behold, several months later, graffiti at that in that area was reduced by 80%. 80% reduction. So that was a solution. That was a solution. I said, wow, if we address the, the, the cause of it, you know, if we get to the root of it, which are the kids and why are they doing it, you know, we have a better chance of eliminating the concept of graffiti, mm -hmm. you know, at least that kind of graffiti, you know, because yeah. we can always get into the, you know, the artwork type. And that's yeah. a whole nother ballgame. We're talking, we're talking gang. Graffiti, yeah, crossing gang, crossing, yeah. mobbing, tagging. Yeah. And I took those findings and took it to, to the Conservation Corps and said, hey, man, check this out. You know what I found out? I found that. that broken window policy. Exactly. And what ended up happening, they, they said, literally, they said, ah, well, we'll take care of that. We don't want this kind of information to be, you know, out in the opening because... Mm -hmm. They won't get no money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the whole reality of nonprofits. Yeah, they're, they're just, mostly they're just maintenance. Exactly. They're it's like, it's like we, we, we don't want to solve the 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 street you know cleanup because then the street cleaners are out of business. We don't want to solve the the the, 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 the this this illness because then mom pharmaceuticals out of business. Yeah. So I I took it like that, and yeah. I, and that's where I became kind of like very. I started having a different attitude towards graffiti removal. I didn't even think graffiti removal was was a valid thing. I mean, you're gonna buff out graffiti. Why? What do I? What do I am? You know, uh, 
you know, but paint buffer. What the hey? I'm a sanitation here. What the? Yeah, no, it's like a maintenance. Treatment. Yeah, so I I really decided to to take it to the next level. So we just started taking the the, the murals to a whole new level, yeah. uh, with the kids, with the with with the, with the programming, uh, uh, partnering with foundations, partnering with people, with an educational component to it. Yeah. Um, we started doing stuff for the uh, Cesar Chavez Foundation, where the street was renamed to Cesar Chavez. You asked the average person, oh, they renamed the street to Cesar Chavez. They, oh yeah, the boxer. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that guy. He had a good right hook, and we're like, no, 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 no. Caesar Chavez was a community. They didn't know who he was, yeah. so yeah. I decided. They were Julio exactly. Was so I, I took my students, and we decided to do a huge campaign to educate the people as to who was Cesar Chavez, and in on the wall because we found out that murals was the quickest way to send out information yeah. to a large amount of people in the shortest amount of time. Well, that's what the church used paintings for. In the exactly. Like. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So okay. So. I'm, I'm now kind of making there's there's always been ever since I've known you now and been going about 20 years or so you've always had this kind of entrepreneurial uh, business approach to what you were doing creative solutions was like a kind of business nonprofit or I, I don't know exactly what that was but it was a kind of business for you to use the business model to kind of pursue that and uh, and use like a kind of contractual model to get jobs and you were talking about uh, hiring these young people as kind of employees to help you. So you've always kind of pursued a kind of business model and the different ventures that you had artistically or through education that, that uh, it was also another kind of a way that you were solving problems or, or finding solutions. Um, can, and, and, you, and you've had different little shops and art supply stores and you've done all kinds of different things since I've known you and this is from sales screen and all kinds of stuff that you've done. Um, but where, where does that kind of drive for the hustle uh, come from and what, why is it so integral? Because it could be just, you could have just took a route and just said, oh, I'm going to get a job, right? Like get a job and I'm going to work for somebody. Either you could have been teaching, painting, any, any of the skill sets that you have. Uh, and you, you even gone into like places where you've like gone into other kinds of fields where I didn't even know if you were coming back to the art, to do art. I was like, well, this guy's going into some other kind of real business, estate, life business insurance. Like, I don't even know where he's going with this. Uh, but but I, I've always seen you kind of come back with uh, bits of information that have served you again in art. Like you kind of go on these kind of side adventures to just pull out more techniques that you bring back to your art business plate uh, can you talk about that being an entrepreneur and how how that really is a uh, just so vital to your practice as an artist uh, for me the the entrepreneurial part was not a choice it was actually survival um, we were talking recently about LA Conservation Corps and all the stuff that I did with them and all the murals and I actually uh, because of some insurance uh, difficulties and stuff like that they couldn't continue to insure me as a driver so I uh, so they had to let me go when they let me go I had the typical nine to five lifestyle my I had the my house rent I had my, my you know all the bills and all the payment whatever so I had nothing to really fall back on I didn't prepare for you know you think you got a job you're gonna stay there forever no matter what happens you know but once they let me go I panicked literally uh, like most people would they, okay how am I going to do this what am I going to do now so the the closest thing the, the most important thing I did was I said what do I do I got to pay the rent I said dude government services they got help they got to help me man I got to pay taxes so I went to GR mm -hmm. go to GR wait in line until 8 in the morning sitting there in a GR building going man they better kick me down come on kick me down with some video the guy interviews me and says yeah man well we can give you something, you know, we, you, we're going to give you a job. You have to work it off. We're going to give you some money, but you can't, we can, can't just give it to you. You don't have a family, you have no kids. You have to work it off. I'm, like, oh, I'm willing to work, you know. So they give me a, 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 a job as a, um, they give me a job to work at their offices, their welfare offices on, in, in what is it, Southgate. Um, so I go, okay. So I, I, I wear a suit, and, you know, like a tie and a shirt, and I, and I go there, and I'm, and I'm, what do you have me to do? So they gave me these little tasks to file and things like that. And I started noticing how their, their their system is working. I was sitting there talking to a couple of the guys that worked there and they, they, they would go all the way to the file cabinet, pick up folders and come all the way back, work on them and go all the way back. And and I said, hey, isn't that like counterproductive? I would tell them, I said, why don't you bring the, 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 the 20 most important cases that you're working on and put them right next to your, your desk. 
Take everything else that is not really, you haven't been working. They're still open, but they're not working. And file those over here. And what? And no, 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 no. They started going, are you the new supervisor? And I started going, excuse me? Are you the new supervisor? Because we're supposed to be getting one, and you're changing the system. You're, they, they didn't even have their files in alphabetical order, bro. So I was like, bro, would it be better if you're looking for a file to go from A to Z? Come on, bro. <laughs> And they and then and everyone thought I was a new supervisor, and until the until I said no, I'm here on GR. They looked at me and literally fell off their chair. They said, "Dude, you're the best guy we've had as an employee, even in employees. What are you doing here?" And that kicked me like if somebody kicked me in the. <laughs> And I said, I don't know. I'm just trying to get some. so I because go. You're used to solving. I'm problems. used to solving problems. You're used to, to finding solutions. You're used to going exactly and using your imagination. Exactly. So when they told me this, I said, Oh man. So I said. So I went back to the to the GR and said, Man, they better. Man, now I organize these guys. I got them working. You know, they better kick me down with some cool feria. You know. So I go back to the GR and get my check. I go, Hey, I haven't got my check in the mail. And they're like, Well, we don't send checks in the mail anymore. And I was like, What? No, you got to go through 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 Nick check cashing and give them this. And you got to give them your ID and they swipe your... I'm like, what? So I go to Nick Cashing, swipe my ID. And for one month of work, they kicked me down with $120. Wow. Dude, now, I the first time I got hit, kicked in the head, now I got kicked in the stomach. <laughs> While you were down. While I was down. <laughs> my rent was like $700 that for that month. And the $150, I was like, you got to be kidding. Is there a... Excuse me. Some mistake? Is there a mistake? Security. Security. <laughs> No, they're the mistake. The I work for them all. Banging on the yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're trying to rob me. So I went back to the GR and waited on another full day. Every time you wait for the GR, it's a full day of, of waiting. And I said, excuse me, you guys made some mistake. The only guys gave me 120 They said, no, because you don't have a family. You don't have kids. You're on your own. We can only give you $120 a month of full work. I was like, that's crazy. So that was an eye opener. That was an awakening. And I, and, I, and I felt like this voice as if God was telling me, I created you for greatness. You know, why are you sitting there in GR waiting for someone Same. to, yeah, somebody to give you a crumb, you yeah. know? And I'd done all these murals already with all the kids. And I said, well, I'm going to just, I'm going to go back to painting murals. I'll figure this one out. And that's where the business began. Mm -hmm. uh, by necessity. Yeah, by necessity. An urgency. An urgency. I went, started going up to a, a, a burger stand and said, hey, man, I can paint you some, some dope burgers on that window, man, that are guaranteed to make anybody's mouth water. The man would look at me like, you really? And he'd go, try me. They, I would paint the most, I mean, juice, I mean, goo, the, you know, the juice is flowing. And Carl's that, Jr. And Carl's Jr. Old, exactly. And the people were like, wow, can you do my other wall? Can you do? And that was the beginning to Creative Art Solutions because uh, once I started doing one mural, you do another one, you do It's like a domino. Just don't stop. And I remember the first time someone said, um, can we, can we, who do we make the check out to? And I remember I said, oh, to John Estrada. And they said, oh, we can't do that. We don't make checks out to people. We can only make checks out to nonprofits, companies, corporations. We need a business because that's how our invoicing system goes. And I'm like, oh, dang, I got to go legal. <laughs> so that's the other step to going DBA, getting you know this, going to your taxes, business. So that just opened up the door. And I've had, I still to this day, this is 1996 that I did Creative Arts Solutions. And Creative Arts Solutions is still around. I still use it. It's still my, my base for everything I do. And uh, that's, your business, that's my business. That's my original business. From that business, uh, like, like you said, I've learned that if you want to grow, you need to know more. If, you, if you're the type of person that thinks where you're at or how you created your machine uh, in business is fine, then you're not going to grow mm -hmm. because you can only grow as, as how much information you know. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, you know, they. Well, that's what uh, Jesus says. You can't put new wine into and, old. and old wine skin. Exactly. That's exactly what it, that, that means. It means if you if you got information and you use it, you put it in in, in something that can't handle that information or doesn't have it, it's not going to hold it. No. So you need to, in other words, if you need to uh, be a, a businessman and you're a hood, you're a thug, it's not going to happen. You know, yeah, you can be a dope dealer and you can pretend to be a businessman, you know, but if you want to be a businessman, you got to find out what the businessman is doing. What the, what does the businessman really know? Mm -hmm. And then learn that and then apply it to your or own business life. Woman. Or business woman. Or exactly. <laughs> yeah. and, and so for me, that's been my journey from creative art solutions to silk screening to owning a, a it's a risk. And... Obviously, I wish I could have done it backwards because I actually did 
because of my personality, I did more experience-based businesses. Mm -hmm. And then later, when you read the books that say, no, you got to get the information first in your head before you take a risk. That way, it's not a blind risk. I said, oh, my God, I did it backwards, you know? So that was my mission was to acquire as much information. But it, that's not much that you did it backwards. That was just, that's just what it takes for you to learn. Exactly. That's the, your, yeah. what your, your learning process is. Right. And that's because I'm an artist, too, you know? Yeah. To me, art, when people talk about art, they, they, they consider the outcome to be the art. And yeah. I think most artists know that it's not the outcome. It's yeah. the process. Well,